I just wanted to show you, I think, I don't know if all of you have seen how small an accessory pathway is. Yen, Ho, a Brompton twin on anatomy, um, always says it's as thin as a hair. It's actually quite, quite difficult to find it. I was recently involved in, in a kind of a yeah, expert review for a, a patient that suddenly died and had unknown some catheter ablation several years prior to his sudden death during a paintball game, otherwise young and healthy men. The question arose if, if he would have had age of ablation and if he would have had conduction across his accessory pathway again, would have been that the explanation for a sudden cat, uh, death. And he was hit by a paintball. You could say cardiac trauma, maybe. But the heart was microscopically uh, normal. So we look very, very careful for an accessory pathway. Actually, this is an old picture that I borrowed from my former chief, karl Cook. So you see, we're talking something very slim, very, very, very tiny. And if you think, if you get the right tracing, you don't need that much of energy to ablate it. You see? how the size here of, of an RF ablation, this is the lesion. This is the atrial myocardium, this is the ventricular myocardium. You see the vessels, they're not so far away, but you're talk, we're talking something very small. And you know, my final slide is going to say, attempt a hole in one, which is a quote that I um, give to Edward Rowland, uh, which I saw uh, doing a very nice case. So this is the slide that I, again, got from Karl Heinz, um, showing, I think, one of his first ablations of accessory pathways. Single catheter at that time. You see uh, the time code here was patient number 162 studied uh, at Eppendorf in Hamburg at that time in 1992 with a single catheter. I was very happy for that single catheter approach, which only works, obviously, with a patient with pre-excitation. Otherwise, you don't have enough places to stimulate from, but you can do it. And he had a very nice tracing here before the onset, and he turned the RF on. And since it's such a small structure, the delta wave goes away. I think we should all be very grateful that that was taken on as the, one of the first targets for catheter ablation. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, because it's so easy to see the difference. Everyone can see the difference. A normal GP can see the difference. Actually, your patient can see the difference. It's absolutely clear what the endpoint is, and it's absolutely clear that that correlates then to uh, freedom of arrhythmia, and that's so easy that catheter ablation, I think since that, these initial heroic ablation attempts has taken off so much, and we are all in work. So there you go. Where our accessory pathways are um, located, most of them are located on the left side. I've put here the, the wording of the um, correct anatomical um, terminology. Richard has had that um, paper on his top reference list, and I think that's quite, quite nice to read it. All the big names um, are on it. Um, it hasn't been used that much, I have to say. Um, we, I would still call that left lateral. I would call that in, you know, posterior. So anyway, we need to have a common language here, and, and I think such a schematic probably would make sense. That was a little bit also my problem when I reviewed that case that I uh, told you about, the sudden death, because the EP report of that patient that I got as reference said, um, a successful ablation of an accessory pathway at CS Electro 3.4. That wasn't helpful at all because I didn't had no clue how far they advanced their CS in, inside the coronary sinus. So that's not a good description of a, a pathway insertion. You need to be yeah, relevant to anatomy and not relevant to your catheter. So when you write a report, you never know what happens to your patient five or ten years from now. So please write your report so that even yourself, if you're quoted or have to come in front of a jury in the worst case, um, you can tell where it was because you cannot recall on your own. And Electro 3.4 can be anywhere, right? So I ended up in that one case to slice the whole annulus, and some poor technician had to look through all of them. It wasn't me, so it was, it was good. Now here we come back to the, essentially, uh, the options that we have when we have an accessory pathway. So different types of pathway. There are pathways that can conduct only Untegrately, Untegrate meaning from the atrial chambers to the ventricles. And they are actually quite rare. They're not so, so often. You can see a delta wave, but it depends on the competition between the AV node conduction and the conduction across the accessory pathway. The delta wave is actually the myocardial tissue that is activated across the pathway. 
That's, I think it's, that's, that's the major understanding that you need to understand when you try to find a pathway insertion on 12 lead ECG. That's the whole clue. Once you get that thing, undergrade conduction is no longer really um, a big issue. Now, it depends on how good the AV node conducts and how good the pathway conducts and how far away the stimulus comes because if that AV node conducts very well and that takes a long time or the pathway is very far away, you might see only a very small delta wave, right? And that is really important and sometimes it's very hard to see if it's a left free wall pathway, there might be only a tiny delta wave. Now there might be times even during the day where there's changes, where the AV node is not so fast, you know, where the patient is more vagal. The pathway is going to conduct with pretty much fixed conduction properties. The AV node changes and then the fusion between pre-excitation and the narrow QRS complex changes. Yeah, so if a lot goes down the AV node and only little reaches the accessory pathway, then you have a small delta wave or vice versa. Yeah? In the worst case, you give some AV nodal blocking agent, you have maximal pre-excitation because then you have no competition. Okay, so what could those people have? They could have antidromic AVRT. Richard already said it's quite rare. You don't see it that fast, but they are at risk of, of conduction of atrial fibrillation across the pathway, and that's quite dangerous. And again, unfortunately, Matthias Anz has left, but Matthias has had published several years ago a very interesting paper of survivors of sudden cardiac death for the, sure, the simple reason of accessory pathway conduction. And the clue is that you can ablate those pathways and they survive. They don't need an ICD, and that's quite obvious. Um, you need to take the connector away. If you have a retrogradely conducting pathway, then you don't see any delta wave anyway. But you have this type of concealed conduction where the activation goes down the conduction system, returns, and hits the atrium again. And then you have the autodromic AVRT. Again, the pathway could be anywhere. It doesn't matter what location you have. It doesn't predilect for any of those um, conduction types. It's a very, very common conduction property. And then you have uh, some pathways you can, that can conduct in both directions, obviously. So in the, in the bidirectional accessory pathways, you actually have all the possibilities. They're at risk for sudden cardiac death. But in the moment that you see a delta wave, always think AF, antidromic tachycardias are not that, that frequent. Again, here's the schematic of how that would go, what are the different options, and you've seen that with Richard, so I'm going to be very quick. My task here, or my, my hint here is always, if you see this kind of ECG and the patient is still talking to you, then it's more likely not VF. If the patient is no longer talking to you, yeah, get really scared and act fast. Yeah, you still need to act fast in AF with WPW, but nevertheless, yeah, if the patient talks to you, that's a good sign. Then you have a little bit more time to think. But my, and this, the same as, as Richard, my advice is if the QRS complex is broad, better be scared. Tell everyone in your hospital, better be scared. And the emergency room people need to know um, that they better act as if it's AVT. Obviously, this is not VT. Now, pathway localization on 12 lead, I'm going to make that short. There are several um, algorithms. They all have somewhat limited specificity and sensitivity, and especially if you have children or patients with congenital heart disease, because they have such a different position of their heart in their chest. And that's, that's the clue. These whole things, basically, you can always start talking about which is the direction of the vector. Where is the, where is the pathway, and is it going this way? Is it going this way, going top to bottom or bottom top? That's the whole thing. But if my heart doesn't sit normally in my chest because I have a very left heart access or I have a very indifferent type or maybe even dextrocardia, then it doesn't work anymore. And that's why they don't fit always. But at least gives you a hint. And again, as Richard said, I think it's important, especially parahisian pathways or pathways, we need to talk about going to the left side. You always have to quote a small risk for stroke if you have to. 
So I'm going to make that fast because it's just, yeah, you saw that before. Um, whereas the pathway is essentially the question, and then um, this one is left lateral. Yeah, so you need to work through some of them, and then you go with one. Basically, I always start, this is left or right, up or down, and then you can learn the, the patterns for the septal ones. Now, here comes the EP study. I think that is, that is more my task now. Now, what kind of things do we have? What kind of tricks do we know? And I, have, I kept it very, very simple. So <clears throat> if you want to know if this person has a pathway and try to locate the pathway, you have several places to stimulate. Yeah? You can stimulate basic stimulation maneuvers to tell you if there's a connection, yes or no, how the AV node conducts, or maybe even accessory pathway conducts, and what happens during tachycardia. So they're basically these, these little tricks, and I try to walk you through that. I always start with ventricular pacing. Let's say this is a patient with well, on-off tachycardia, narrow QRS complex tachycardia, but you don't have even the tracings, but you were told by a reliable source that um, was documented. And I want to know, the first thing I want to know is how many conduction connections does this patient have from the ventricles to the atrium. So if I pace the ventricle, and I do that in a program way, so I have a, give a basic cycle length, and then I do an S2, and I now shorten that and shorten that and shorten that. And I want to know how are the atria answering to that stimulus. And I want to see if it's decremental conduction. Do I see any jumps, any sudden prolongations? Where is the earliest atrial activation? Does that change at any point? Or do we even induce tachycardia? Now, where do I put my catheters at this position? I'm, I have a catheter, actually, I have a slightly special catheter. I use a catheter that has two distal electrodes that sit in the right ventricle. And on the same catheter, I have some more proximal electrodes where the his area is. And that gives me on one catheter basically both together. But you can have a his hugger or his bundle recording electrode and a distal apex catheter. And that's very elegant. And as normally in those kind of procedures, I put a catheter, at least one catheter in the coronary sinus. And if you're happy to have a high right HM catheter, if you're in a rich hospital, then go for that as well. So you know what the left atrial activation is. You can basically cover the mitral annulus, far more often left-sided pathways, as I showed you in the schematic. And if you have a high right atrial tachycardia um, a catheter, then it tells you if the right side is early but you could also use your map, so you could maybe save a cat. So if we simulate <clears throat> and we have no accessory connection, we could have complete VA block, right? We stimulate and there's no answer on the atrial side, and that's VA block. So that's for sure no pathway, and that's already done. If you have the accessory, uh, the, the conduction system that brings you the, electro the activation backwards to the atrium, then this will answer in a decremental fashion to the slowly narrowed in stimulus, extra stimulus. So if you program your simulator to shorten that by 10 milliseconds, you're going to see it's getting it later, later and later and later and later and later. And I quite like this. You can actually show your your pictures like this on your recording system that you can measure that interval. If it gets longer and longer and longer and longer, and it's really convenient, you can just look at it and it's just going to happen. If you have a pathway, then it depends on how close to the pacing side this pathway is so that you can see a change. If you have both the conduction across the conduction system and the pathway. Now in this schematic here, the pathway is quite far away from the right ventricular simulation side. So if this conduction across the conduction system is faster, and this takes a long time, you might not necessarily see a change. You might not have this being the earliest A. A couple of small tricks, I'm going to show you how to do that. If it's a right-sided pathway and you are pacing from the right ventricle, that's actually quite normal to that, that, you can, that you're going to be faster with a pathway, right? And that's quite clever. Okay, let's look at some tracings. 
and I'm just, uh, I only have one question here, but I want you to, to look with me through the tracings. So what we do here is we, we stimulate from the apex. I have a coronary sinus catheter, I have a his recording catheter, and I have a high right atrium catheter, and then um, surface ECGs. So we bring this S2 here in, and we look at the sequence. And at the very moment, I have a his atrium. I'm just going to show you some a line here. The his atrium is the first atrium that activates. Okay. So at the very moment, I would say, hmm, the his atrium is first. So it looks like the activation goes across the conduction system, right? But you can also see which is actually quite f interesting that normally, if you would think this is AV node conduction, you would think that the proximal coronary sinus would be activated first. And here we have the distal coronary sinus, or maybe 3, 4, being also quite early activated. And actually, the V and the A is already fusing here. But funny enough, the A is still the earliest in the HES. OK, what do we do? We just give the next one a bit earlier. Yeah? So we bring this shorter. And now you see that the AV node con conducts decrementally. So the A here moves out, but the A here stays. Yeah? And that's very simple. If you have an extra stimulus page, you can make that jump, the next train, and you see again. And you just put your caliper. I usually have my caliper from the artifact to the earliest A. And I can simultaneously see what happens. It's very easy and elegant. Earliest A is here. And that's late. So I know already, yeah, I have a change of the activation. The AV node is longer now. And, the, and I know where the pathway is. And I essentially know already what my next step is. I could go and try to induce a tachycardia, but I know what the substrate of the arrhythmia of this patient is. And I plan my next step. I can already ask for whatever I want. I can ask for an additional sheath. I can ask for a transeptal puncture kit, whatever you choose then to do for this patient. But you have the diagnosis, essentially with, within the first three minutes of your study. If you bring that even earlier in, the AV node is going to be more and more decremental. So it's going to be becoming clearer and clearer and clearer. And the pathway has mostly fixed conduction. So this interval here will not change much. At one point, the pathway is going to be refractory. And then it's going to stop. And then the AV node is going to lead again. Or maybe the AV node is completely blocked by that time. And then it stops altogether. Yeah, so then you can figure out exactly one which part of the, part that the components here is, is um, turning off its conduction. OK, what are the limitations? It, as I said before, um, you might have <clears throat> a pathway that is very far away. Yeah, that's number two. Or you could have a change in the A sequence, but you jump from the fast pathway to the slow pathway. Now, that, there's a nice hint. You can see the sequence in the coronary sinus. Yeah, because again, the proximal would be decremental if it's, path, uh, if it's avino conduction, and the proximal coronary sinus, if you keep that catheter fairly proximal, should be the earliest. And then you see decremental conduction. Now, what is the trick if the pathway is very far away? There's actually some easy tricks. You can try to pace a bit closer to the pathway insertion. Now, the easiest trick is to turn that apex catheter around and put it to the outflow tract. The right ventricular outflow tract crosses the heart, right? So the aorta goes this direction, and, and the right ventricular outflow tract goes this way. And by putting the catheter up to the RVOT, you come closer to the left side. And that's exactly what you see here. It's the same patient. You see apex stimulation in the right ventricle shows you that the earliest A is at his medium here. And when you pace closer to the pathway, you enter the pathway much earlier, and you see now that there is an accessory pathway. And again, it's a very simple trick. Just turn the catheter around, and you have your diagnosis. Now here, you can look into what can happen. You need to always look very carefully. Sometimes things happen spontaneously. Yeah? So we're pacing here from the apex. You see that? But out of a sudden, there is a different ventricular exosystole, and that changes the direction. That's yeah? probably a fusion beat here. And then you see the A changes. And the A gets very early on the coronary sinus again. 
And that's again speaks very much for a left-sided pathway. Exactly one beat. Yeah? And then you could actually, if you see this, you're not entirely sure you can turn the cathode up to the outflow tract. And then you could repeat that. So with this ventricular program, ventricular stimulation, you already can figure out how many connections do you have. Is there any conduction, decremental conduction, fixed conduction? And is the AV node earlier or later than your earliest A? Uh, that's, I think it's, it's a quite elegant way to address it. So simple steps, trying not to confuse yourself. Then I repeat the same thing from the atrial side. Same kind of mechanism. You just change the patient pacing channel. And again, the next question is, if you do that from the atrium, do you have decremental undergrade conduction? Does it jump? Where's the earliest ventricular activation? Is there any change in the ventricular activation? And do you induce tachycardia? Again, simple questions. You just watch it. You start your programmer, and then you just watch your simulator, and then you just see it happening. So if you have no accessory pathway, you, know, you might have dual AV node properties. You might jump from one to the other. But that's very simple, actually, to observe. Right? You will see that when the extra stimulus comes shorter and shorter, you can have your interval, and then you will have the definition for a jump. And that's not so difficult to understand. If you have a pathway, then yeah, ideally, yeah, you have more and more decremental conduction across the AV node, and you might have more and more pre-excitations if you're, if you're lucky, and the stimulus is not too far away from the insertion. Well, it's much easier to do that um, on the right side. But again, it depends on what happens between this place that you pace from and the place where the pathway is. If you have a lot of scars here, yeah, that can still be very misleading. Yeah? So always think in that schematic what happens on the way. And if the AV node is much slower, then you're going to have more pre-excitation. It's always a competition. Now, this is called many different things. <laughs> where I trained, it was called preceding. And some people call it his synchronous V or whatever you want. You want to reset the tachycardia with the ventricular excess stimulus that you try to send up when the conduction comes down the conduction system. Yeah? And the question is, what happens? Does anything happen? And does the sequence change? So we are now in tachycardia. We have a tachycardia induced. And now we want to know what happens when we go a ventricular, give a ventricular extra. So what could happen? <clears throat> if you have AV and RT, the tachycardia happens somewhere here. And we give a stimulus from here. There is collision, and the tachycardia just keeps on going. Nothing is going to happen. Your AA intervals are going to stay the same. If you have an AVRT and you give an extra, then again, one wavefront, like in, in Jesus' um, schematic, one extra is going to go here and block that part, and one is going to go up, use the same pathway, and reset the tachycardia. And since you're stimulating faster, it's going to reset. It's going to pull that atrium forward. And you're going to precede the atrial activation. That's why it was called preceding. Oh, let me go back. This is quite important. Depending on if the pathway is far away from where you try to do that, you still have collision, but it does necessarily, might, it depends again on the conduction time that you have over here. Yeah? And again, if it's very far away, you might see only very small changes, if at all. So, you could repeat the same thing again from a different place. OK, so here's an example. We have tachycardia, same order of the uh, signals. And um, we're stimulating, uh, send, uh, send stimulus from the ventricle. OK, the first trick is always to see that you really capture. <laughs> you should change somehow, a little bit at least, the QS morphology. Yeah? It's going to be a fusion. Yeah? If you don't change at all, you haven't captured. And that sometimes when people make the mistake that you don't, ca that you don't capture and you, you have a pacing artifact, but you will never change anything because you just not, didn't capture the ventricular signal. OK, let's have a look a little bit of what we see. We have A's and H's and try to mark them a little bit. And then I'm going to show you that the cycle length here is 330. We gave this extra stimulus. And actually, this should be a little bit further here. Anyway, what happens is. With bringing that ventricular extra in, 
We pull the next the AA forward. You can actually see it. If you eyeball it, you can see it. But again, you can download those slides and you can actually measure it yourself. And by pulling this HM forward, you can actually see yeah, that we actually precede. Now the there's collision, I'm gonna show you, I think I uh, know. There's collision in the conduction system. And the impulse now travels around to left-sided pathway and comes in a little bit earlier. Now, how do I know a left-sided pathway? I know that already. If you look to the sequence again, the A in the His is late. The A in the coronary sinus is early. I can even say that must be very close to either electrode 2, 3 or 3, 4. Right? And you can measure this here. It's very easy if you measure it. And again, you're in your EP lab. You can measure it. You can measure it with a caliper. Yeah? And it's only 50 milliseconds, so you need to measure accurately. Okay, summit stimulation. Unfortunately, Matthias is gone. Matthias ha has, a, has a passion for summit stimulation. He's done that many times with him. Anyway, so what is summit? The, the clue is that you stimulate with a position close to the conduction system, and once you try it with high output stimulation, you try to capture the conduction system, whereas you try to capture the myocardium around it. And I think it's quite nice. I, I think I, I, I owe Matthias those slides. So you, you need to compare a narrow QRS complex with a broad neuro, a QRS complex. And here is the schematic for it. So again, um, I advise you to work through those tracings. And there are beautiful examples. Um, um, Sunny Jackman has, and, and they, that group has, has made fantastic tracings for that. So if you are capturing the conduction system, the activation goes retrograde. Yeah? and uses the retrograde conduction properties of the AV node. And you have short intervals. And if you just capture the ventricle, it's going to take that detour. It's going to take that time to enter it again and come back the same way. So the atrial activation sequence is the same. The intervals just get longer. Yeah? That is pretty logic, right? Now, if you have a pathway... But again, it depends where the pathway exactly is, what the conduction times are in between. You have a change of the activation sequence. It's very important to look at all of these things, see where the hiss comes, where the intervals change, and what electrodes are activated earliest. And again, follow the activation sequence. If you capture here, it takes a time to come out here. Yeah, so the sequence changes, but the AV node conduction also has, has made changes here. So again, it's worth measuring them through and try to get very much on top. It changes dramatically, and it's very good if you have a, a, an accessory pathway very close to the conduction system, and then, then it helps you quite a lot to change, see the changes. Now, there are a couple of smaller other changes. Sometimes things happen, and it's always good to see to observe when these things happen and try to take your deductions from things like extra beats or when the QRS morphology changes and cycle length changes. Now, by looking at these tracings, could you tell me where the pathway is? If it's a pathway tachycardia, maybe. <laughs> Anyone wants to shout something? A left bundle branch tachycardia? that is slow, that changes to a narrow QS tachycardia, and is, therefore, left-sided pathway. Okay, that's very important. I hope that the next um, slide is going to opsa, show that to everyone who hasn't that completely in his head. If you, let's start this way. If you have a left bundle branch block, so it takes longer for that re-entrance circuit, and then the block stops, you have conduction again, the tachycardia cycle length gets shorter because the, the, the pathway is now short and the whole circuit is shorter. And that's why the cycle lengths get shorter. Now, if you would have the pathway on this side and the right bundle branch block, then the same thing would happen again. The pathway is on the side of the block, and that's why it's getting slower. Yeah? Okay. So for accessory pathway ablation, coming um, a little bit closer to um, treatment, I do it the same way that Matthias described it, um, is looking for a small electrode. I would not use a large electrode. I think you don't need to have so much energy to destroy a lot of tissue. 
Um, the small electrode, actually the ideal electrode would be a split tip. You have fantastic resolution. Um, you want to go for small, something small. I'm going to show you something like an AP potential in a moment. And what I quite, quite like is, um, and Richard has pointed that out, um, is not only looking at um, the bipolar electrograms, but also looking at the unipolar uh, electrograms um, from the tip. Because it comes through such a small thing. And then it's, it's basically like a focal source, like, like Jesus explained. It comes from a tiny, t tiny little thing. And that's why once you're on it, you have a QS morphology. And if you're a little bit away, you still have a small R. So that's a very nice setting, a very nice trick to look for it. Energy settings, I try to be having a lot of energy delivery very fast. So I actually go to a higher temperature than I would normally do. Um, I would go for 60, 65 degrees and I try to deliver 50 to 60 watts. I'm already happy if I reach 47, 48 degrees, but I want to be on, block it, and be fast. It's very important that, well, first of all, you look for the right potentials, the best timing, but it's also very, very important during ablation to be stable. Stable so that the electrograms where your blade doesn't have much beat to beat changes. In fact, it should look exactly the same way. Yeah? So it means that you swing very nicely with the, with the tissue. That you're, if it's going, uh, showing you a, better, a bigger A or a smaller V, and it changes B to B or changes massively, you're not stable enough. You're not going to block it. You might be at the right place, but you don't have enough contact to deliver in the tissue. OK, then you can <clears throat> find out what is the best way of doing this. If you have pre-excitation, you could <laughs> ablate in sinus rhythm. Yeah, you would look to the earliest V, yeah, have a nice A to V relationship, yeah, have yeah, very nice contact, that's all okay, great. If you say, okay, I have a concealed pathway, so that's out of the question. Now you could go for relatively slow ventricular pacing that shows you clear conduction, no fusion, but clear conduction across the pathway. Again, you can figure that out in the first part of the diagnostic study. And then in the very controlled fashion, you deliver current. You don't, what you want to avoid is that with a sudden rate change, for example, the catheter becomes instable and just dislodged. Yeah? So if you do ablations during AVRT, a lot of people like to do that. I think it's a little bit impractical because you sometimes dislodge. In the moment that you block conduction, you dislodge, and then you might have not completely done your lesion yet. And then you have a halfway ablated pathway, and that's always trouble. You know? And then it means at least another hour, I think. And it's very, very neat if you have a pathway potential. Then I think you shouldn't wait much longer. You should just go for it, because then you're right on it. OK, you need to sure have effect within the five seconds. And if, it's, if you use a cold tip catheter, that might be longer because the generators are programmed differently. They ramp up the energy. So then uh, probably 10 seconds is still, uh, still enough. If you haven't blocked in 10 seconds, forget about it. You're not at the right place or you're not stable enough. How long should that take you? <laughs> I just showed this uh, just for a general overview. It's actually not that recent anymore. Um, but you can see it takes uh, different centers yeah, various times. This is a little bit older, so you can see this took a little bit longer. And now, actually, times come down. Fluoroscopy time, I think, is quite long here. Yeah, depending on where you want to go, I think you should maybe make an effort to make that a bit shorter. Um, this is also quite a lot of uh, median applications here, or mean applications. So again, I would try to get at the best position and then make your pathway. So I look over to Jesus. How much more? 10 minutes? Quick. Uh, no. Quick. PGRT. PGRT are permanent junction reentrant tachycardias on the basis of an accessory pathway with decremental conduction. Mostly young patients and they have quite an interesting thing. In that program simulation that I told you before, you're going to see decremental oh. conduction and you see already a long VA interval, but you see a little bit, yeah, tiny interval, a tiny signal here, and you're going to see you induce a junctional or a, a BGRT with a negative P wave, and then it carries on. I think the, the um, ECGs that we show, shown before uh, were actually quite nice. You can see here when I bring the S2 in, it gets longer and longer and longer. So that's a very nice way. Again, if you have seen that and you can induce the ticardia, uh, 
reproducibly. Then you need to look out for that, and they're usually post receptively You look, need to look very, very carefully in that area. Mostly young adolescents or, or young children. Maheim, again, I make that short. Yeah, it's like like a second AV node that connects to the conduction system, and you see that with giving atrial excess stimulus, you see a lengthening, but you also see more and more pre-excitation, left bundle bench block type pre-excitation, and the clue is here. If you see that sequence where the ventricular activation, the apex catheter gets earlier and the his is activated retrograde, if that is the order of activation, that can only be in Maheim. Now, during tachycardia, you see that you now do the entrainment from the atrial side. A late atrial excess stimulus pulls the ventricular activation in. It's essentially the same way, but as I showed you for the his synchronously, you pull the QRS complex forward. Okay, well, I probably gave that away now. <laughs> okay, I gave that away, sorry. I, I missed up the last, the only question, sorry. So what happens here is you, the, uh, uh, there is the A, and the A extra stimulus pulls this forward, and then the interval changes. Sorry for mucking that up. Sorry for that. What do you look for for a pathway ablation? You look at the untrue lateral free wall to posterior aspect of the tricuspid annulus, and you look very, very careful for these kind of signals. They look like a his potential. And you need to be very, very careful because they're very touch sensitive. If you bump it, one of my previous consultants, <coughs> Ricardo Capato, has published that this is a way of finding them, bumping them, and then you cannot ablate anymore. And then you wait for an hour or longer, and I've been there. Um, it's not such a cool um, technique because you wait for a long time for that pathway to reconnect and reconduct. Um, so you, you look very, very careful. You might choose to have a long sheath to stabilize your catheter, or you might choose to come from above because that gives you more stability. <clears throat> if it's an antroceptal pathway, I quite like, and that's the way, again, I was trained to come from above because that gives you a far better stability. I have not used iri um, cool tip ablations for this, and I usually debate Jesus on the topic, and I nearly always win. That's quite good, <laughs> because he's such a gentleman, that's why. Um, but I, I really like the stability, and you have very nice way of mapping carefully. And I'm, we've just got a, a paper f um, accepted in Europe Pace for a six-year-old um, young girl with a parahessian um, pathway. And we did exactly the same thing, and I did it with magnetic navigation. So uh, you can even be even more precise by just turning the vector a little bit. And you can, by pacing maneuvers before, uh, again, coming to the refractory period of the pathway, you could see how close you are to the his before you even ablate. So you can really make sure where you are in which relationship and how close you are and how dangerous it's going to be. So that's, I think it's a very nice check. Let me go back once and point out the QRS complex and the Q QS. It's very important. And the AP potential is very important here as well. Um, another thing that is important is always to think when you're, not, when you're not successful, why are you not successful? You need to think about adjacent structures that might be actually even closer to the pathway than, you, than the place that you are. And this is a very nice case, that um, actually a, a case where we failed ablation several times um, in an antroceptal pathway, and it turned out to be a accessory pathway that was located in the non-coronary cusp, or let's say when we had the catheter there, we were even closer to this pathway and we were finally able to block it. And that's just to know, again, it comes back to the importance of anatomy, and I think anatomy is probably 60% if not 70% of EP. If you know your anatomy, that's the major thing. If you know where the artery is, then it's so logic that you need to look there. But we, we didn't know and we didn't realize it for a long time. The same is true <clears throat> if anatomy is a bit different. Epicardial ablation sometimes and postural septal pathways are very, very difficult because the anatomy is not normal. You might have these little diverticular or sometimes even larger. Yen has a picture that is the largest, the mother of all diverticular. It looks like it's larger than the right atrium. It's massive. Now, <clears throat> whenever you go for a postural septal pathway and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work with one or two or three burns, I think you should right away uh, think about injecting dye because 
There is no hint. Nothing can tell you that you, you're facing this. This is one of the first ba cases that I was asked in London to take over on a Friday afternoon. It's my, my uh, Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock pathway. Sure, no problem. I take your case. Yeah, thank you. Still a bit upset about this. Anyway, my trick here is if you fail ablation, you better inject dye earlier than later because otherwise you're going to be in the dark. <clears throat> I take an AL2 catheter basically that you normally take for your left coronary, and you just put it up the opposite way. And that nearly always jumps nicely in the coronary sinus. Not much trick that is needed. Now you can nicely put it in and inject dye, and then you can see these kind of things. And the clue is you need to go to the neck. That's where the accessory pathways are. And again, coming to the neck, you see that here? You can try from below, but if that is difficult, then try it from above, because you get a slightly different angle. And sometimes the angle is enough to get a better position. And then, again, you see the beautiful QS signal that we have to had here and the nice AP potential. You turn the RF on, and it blocks nearly instantly. Take all the tricks that you can have, and don't make life e difficult. That's really my, my task to tell you. If it's very difficult, sometimes it helps to have a little bit of a guide. The picture doesn't show very well anymore, and it's too old. I haven't done it um, for a long time. A free wall pathway, sometimes very, very difficult. Sometimes it's because difficult because you're unstable and you need a long sheath to stabilize, but sometimes it's quite very difficult to find exactly where, especially if someone else has ablated before. So the trick here was to put a very thin multi-electrode catheter in the right coronary, and that right coronary beautifully wraps around the tricuspid annulus. We call it the spaghetti catheter. There is a Kadima, is the company that I know that does it. It's too French. And you put it in, and then you can see where A and B is the earliest. Right? And then you can age, actually yeah, calc uh, count where electrode 3, 4 is. And then you can go and basically try to put these two catheters together in, in two projections. And you can try anatomically to blade on the earliest epicondyl connection. So um, that's quite nice, and probably irrigated tip would help as well. Pathways, I'm going to be quick with um, Epstein's because it's really an advanced um, setting. Epstein patients have multiple pathways, most of them. Um, if you have one, it doesn't mean that the other ones are not, for example, concealed. So you always need to do a full stimulation afterwards. Patients that have one can always have two. You see that patients with normal anatomy don't that often have multiple um, pathways. But even a normal patient can have more than one. And you should not be caught out that this patient has a recurrence and has to come back to the EP lab just because you forgot to do your control stimulation. That should always be part of your um, overall approach. So my conclusion is careful diagnostic EP study. That's the time well invested. Try to be very systematic in doing it. Try to understand how many connections there are, what their, their conduction properties are, and then try to pinpoint the site of ablation down as much as you can before you actually go and try to map in the target area. Stability is very important. Consider, when you, when you think about stability, consider how you go to that um, area. If you go transeptal, if you go retrograde, if you go from below, femoral, or if you go from superior. It really depends on where you need to ablate. And try to block with the first ablation. It's really the hole-in-one of Edwin Lowland, who is the king of golf, I guess. <laughs> and that's why it is called one hole-in-one. Thank you very much.